Hello, everyone. We're going to get started. Thank you all for joining us for the April 2023 monthly seminar on physical genomics. My name is James Peterson, and I'm the Senior Director of Operations at the Center for Physical Genomics and Engineering here at Northwestern University. Our center is a cross-disciplinary research center that is focused on elucidating the structure and function of the genome through a convergence of super-resolution imaging, modeling, computational genomics, biology, and artificial intelligence. The mission of the center is to develop new strategies for the treatment of disease and the reversible engineering of living systems and to train the next generation of multidisciplinary scientists. You can learn more about our research at physicalgenomics.northwestern.edu or follow us on Twitter. We're very excited to welcome as our invited speaker today, Dr. Amino Dada, an assistant professor in the Department of Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering at the University of Notre Dame. Professor Dada received her PhD in chemical and biological engineering from Tufts University in 2018, after which she completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital. Her research focuses on deciphering the atypical tumor microenvironment that drives disease progression and treatment resistance in incurable cancers. Dr. Dada, at this point, if you'd like to share your screen, we can begin your presentation for our audience. There will be time for questions at the conclusion of the talk, or you can type them into the Zoom chat and we will address them afterwards. Dr. Dada, thank you so much once more for joining us and I will turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak today. And uh, it's my pleasure to tell you about some of the work that, that I've been doing over the last couple of years. So let me go ahead and share my screen here. All right, can you see my screen and my laser pointer? Yep, looks great. Excellent. So yeah, I'm Emil Dada. I'm a relatively new assistant professor here at Notre Dame in the Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering Department. It might sound a little bit odd that I'm going to talk about biology and about cancer being in a department like Aerospace and Mechanical, but it turns out that this is the department at Notre Dame that houses bioengineering. We're actually all part of one, one very large department here. Um, and so today I'm going to speak about some of the work I've been doing over the last few years to try to understand abnormal mechanical forces in brain tumors and the types of implications that this might have for immunotherapy. So I'm definitely going to be discussing more at the cellular and tissue scale. I know most of this audience is probably working at the subcellular scale, but I hope at least there'll be some, um, some commonalities for, for discussion later. Um, just looking here at my conflicts, I have no conflicts to disclose, but I am going to be discussing off-label use of the drug Losartan. And it's sort of a brief um, outline of, of my talk today. So I'm an engineer by, by training, and this is a fantastic audience to be able to speak to because I think you'll understand much of the, the biophysical work that, that I have under consideration in my research program. And um, what I sort of think about when I think about brain tumors are pathologies that lie in mechanics, which we refer to as mechanopathologies or mechanical pathologies. And so I'm going to give sort of a brief overview of the concepts. Um, in particular, in brain tumors, many people are already focused on what's known as edema or mass effect. And I'm going to show that we have physical terms to, to describe these that are well known um, on the research side as well as the clinical side. I'll also discuss sort of where these mechanical abnormalities arise from, and most importantly, the consequences that they have on the, on the health of patients and the outcome of therapies, uh, with a large focus on um, the primary brain tumor glioblastoma, but a bit about um, brain metastases as well. And then finally, I'll show some of the work um, that I published two months ago, um, wrapping up from my postdoctoral work, that we can actually combat some of these mechanical properties in order to improve the outcomes of, of therapy in brain tumors, particularly in the case of, of immunotherapy. So again, I'm a, I'm a chemical engineer by training. I'm now a mechanical engineer by teaching, and we'll see, we'll see what happens in the, in the coming years. Uh, but I focus mostly on abnormalities in tissue microenvironments that sort of drive um, disease progression and treatment resistance. And I've been really fortunate to work in sort of a variety of different types of cancers. So for example, um, some of my work has been done in breast cancer brain metastases, um, in hepatocellular carcinoma, in ovarian tumors. And I've even been able to apply some of these concepts to non-cancerous diseases, including benign tumors like vestibular schwannoma, which arises in the ear due to a genetic condition, um, and even infectious disease. So actually all of my um, doctoral work as a graduate student was focused on tuberculosis, which forms these masses in the lung that behave and look a lot like a tumor. 
But most of my recent work over the last few years has been focused on glioblastoma, which I'm going to call GBM for, for the rest of this talk. And this is the deadliest primary brain tumor in adults. Um, it's not highly prevalent. I actually just found out today, I was speaking with a program officer at the DOD that technically this falls under a rare cancer. It, the incidence is about um, three in 100,000 um, US patients today. But uh, it's highly resistant to therapy, um, including traditional therapies like radiation and chemotherapy, but it's also resistant to new therapies, including immunotherapy. And a large reason that um, tumors like glioblastoma are resistant to therapy is because of what we refer to as this abnormal tumor microenvironment, which really drives this disease progression and treatment response. So I know, I'm assuming not everybody on the call um, works in, in cancer, so I'll give just sort of a brief overview here of what I mean by, by tumor microenvironment. So um, cancerous tumors, of course, aren't simply just balls of cancer cells. They actually contain all the same components as our, as our normal tissues, including the host cells that might have originally been present in that organ to begin with. Um, but the problem is that in, in cancerous tumors, every single one of these components is behaving abnormally. And for the most part, it's actually working to, to support the cancer. So for example, we'll have a prevalence of, of cancer cells and perhaps some host cells, immune cells, stromal cells that might be sort of tightly clustering together, proliferating and overproducing this extracellular matrix scaffolding that, that holds everything together. Blood vessels can be present and are often um, overly present in tumors, but they tend to be highly poorly formed um, and leaky. In the case of um, tumors outside of the brain, uh, lymphatic vessels can sometimes be present, but they're 100% non-functional, and we don't see lymphatic vessels within the tumor of uh, brain tumors. And really all of this sort of cooperates to create an environment that's um, both hypoxic and immunosuppressive. So the immune system can't do its job to, to fight against the cancer within this um, abnormal tumor microenvironment. And really it sort of um, serves to actually promote the cancer, including host cells that might be sort of co-opted by the cancer to support them as well. For example, cancer associated fibroblasts or T regulatory cells. But in addition to all of these factors, which we really sort of consider biochemical in nature, there are also physical or mechanical abnormalities that we find in the tumor microenvironment. So this includes mechanical properties such as tissue stiffness, um, as well as tissue microarchitecture, which we really describe as sort of the complex 3D maze that cells have to navigate through. There might be folks on the call who work on, for example, what happens to nuclear deformation as cells squeeze and pull themselves between um, tight pores or through other obstacles. There's also mechanical forces at play within the tumor microenvironment, um, the best of which that's known as fluid pressure, which is also referred to clinically as edema, this buildup of fluid. And the reason that this happens is because of this abnormal leaky tumor vasculature, um, which leaks fluid out from the blood vessels into the, into the rest of the tumor. But there's also a mechanical property that my, my former lab, my training lab called solid stress. And the reason that we call it solid stress is really to distinguish it from the pressure that's exerted by the fluid components of the tissue. So solid stress is the pressure that's exerted only by the solid components of the tissue. So the cells and perhaps the extracellular matrix molecules that they produce. And in terms of these mechanical pathologies, some have been highly well described. For example, stiffness is already a prognostic or predictive biomarker in cancers like triple negative breast cancer. But solid stress is sort of a, a relatively new idea. And in terms of what we currently know about this mechanical force, we know that it can induce um, cancer cell migration, for example, by upregulating pathways like beta catenin and Wnt. Really importantly, it can actually squeeze shut these abnormal tumor blood vessels that were already poorly formed and, and leaky to begin with, and now they're getting completely um, squeezed shut. So this further um, reduces perfusion in the tumor, which can obviously impact um, negatively impact drug delivery and drug efficacy as well. So as I was sort of wrapping up my training and getting ready to transition um, over to my independent position, I became very interested in does this mechanical force occur in, um, in tumors in the brain where the brain has this added complication that it's housed within this rigid skull. So as we have this sort of buildup of 
of either fluid or, or solid mechanical forces, we have to deal with the fact that we have a volumetric confinement. There's only so far the, the brain can expand versus if you had um, a tumor of the breast or, or of the liver. Um, and so we started to look at what was happening in terms of these mechanical forces, starting with this idea that blood vessels are collapsed. We predicted that they would be collapsed within the brain tumor, um, but we wanted to see what else is happening in, in the rest of the brain as well. And so we used a technique, um, optical coherence tomography, to um, look at, at perfused blood vessels within the brains of mice. So this is a mouse that's been implanted with a transparent cranial window. This is almost one centimeter in diameter, so we're getting almost the entire brain of the mouse. And you can see here that the, the tumor, in this case it's a glioblastoma or a GBM, the area that it takes up has been outlined in green. And so you can see within the green area, we have this very typical highly chaotic vasculature of a brain tumor um, where we have lots of tiny um, blood vessels that don't look anything like the blood vessels in the rest of the surrounding normal brain. And in this type of imaging, um, only perfused blood vessels show up. So if you see a blank spot, it means that there probably is a blood vessel there because the brain is, is full of blood vessels, but it's not showing up on this movement-based imaging because there's no perfusion through that blood vessel. There's no movement of fluid or red blood cells. So any place that's a gray means that we are likely to have a blood vessel that's been compressed shut by those, those mechanical forces, including solid stress. So this wasn't entirely unexpected, but we were really surprised to see the effect to which um, these blood vessels were compressed actually away from the tumor, including close to it, but even further away in the contralateral hemisphere. So you can see here in these sort of pop-out images that there are quite a few areas where we have gray space lacking these um, perfused blood vessels, because even in the normal brain, these mechanical forces are being exerted and, and compressing normal blood vessels shut as well. And you can see that the sagittal sinus, this largest blood vessel in the brain, um, was originally in this position indicated by this white dotted line. But now due to the mechanical forces um, of this tumor, it's actually shifted all the way over into, into the other hemisphere of the brain. So this is really showing us that there are some profound mechanical forces at play here. But it's also very obvious, you know, as, as preclinical researchers, um, when we look at an image like this, a clinician could say, this tumor is taking up almost half of the mouse brain. This is an artifact of, of growing a, a very large um, tumor in a, in a model. So we wanted to confirm that this was happening in patients as well. So we actually teamed up with some um, clinical collaborators to look at perfusion MRI to see if we could detect, again, the sort of loss of blood vessel perfusion due to the compress uh, compression or collapse of blood vessels close to, close to the tumor. And that's exactly what we saw in patients. So the way that we read this graph is 100% here means that we're at the normal level of brain perfusion. This is where we want to be. And as we move along this graph towards the left-hand side, so we're moving down in the x-axis, you can see that perfusion starts to drop off significantly. And as we move closer and closer to the tumor here, we're basically at the tumor border, we're almost at 60% of the normal perfusion that we would expect um, to see in the brain. So this is a significant decrease in, in vascular perfusion. And if you look at the area over which this is occurring, it's about one centimeter where we see this, this drop in perfusion. And that might not sound like a lot at first, but if you think about the volume of the brain that's held within a one centimeter shell around a tumor, that's actually quite a significant amount of brain volume. And so that could be really negatively impacting the, the health of the patient. So we wanted to think about what else might be going on. If we're compressing blood vessels in the area close to the tumor, what else are we compressing? Since we were looking at the brain, it was logical to think about neurons and, and neurological health. So I'm showing here just a, a qualitative image. Um, in the paper, we quantified this as well, but you can see here that not only are blood vessels sort of squeezed close to the tumor, but um, neurons are, are as well. So this is a stain for neuronal nuclei, and you can see that close to the tumor, which is outlined here in red, in these little pop-outs, you can see that the nuclei have become sort of squeezed and, and elongated in their shape. But if you move further and further away from the tumor out into the, the healthy brain, you can see that they become more normal and more rounded in, in their appearance. 
I'm not showing the quantification here, but it turns out that the density of neurons as you get closer and closer to the tumor drops off as well. So even though we're compacting the tissue, we're actually losing neurons and losing that, that density of, of neural cells the closer and closer we get to the tumor. And one of the things that we found was this phenomenon was um, largely dependent on the way the tumor was growing or sort of the growth phenotype of, of these tumors. So glioblastoma is a very heterogeneous disease. Every patient has basically a different looking tumor and they can, wide, uh, they can vary widely between, let's say a tumor that grows almost more like a ball. You can see here, there's actually a very clean demarcation between the edge of the tumor and the brain. It's very easy to see. This tumor is just sort of growing and expanding just like a a ball within the, the tissue. Um, and you can see that this tumor is exerting um, higher levels of this mechanical force solid stress on the surrounding brain, which I'm showing here in a, in a heat map. But other types of tumors um, in the brain tend to grow in a more infiltrative pattern. So they're sort of spreading out like fingers into the surrounding brain um, and replacing the brain tissue as they grow rather than just simply expanding their mass and adding volume to the, to the brain itself. So in this case, we have more of a conservation of volume because we're sort of killing the brain at the same time that the tumor is expanding. And you can see here that the nuclei look much more normal and rounded in, in, their, um, in their shape compared to the, um, the neurons that are closer to a more nodular growing tumor. And um, by quantification, we see that the amount of, of solid stress that's exerted on the surrounding brain is lower in, in these types of, of tumor growth. Um, so we wanted to know, again, was this sort of an artifact of the mouse? And what does this mean potentially in the case of um, of patients. So what we did is we again teamed up with that same group of clinical collaborators and we um, retrospectively collected MRI images of brain tumor patients and we classified them in these two growth phenotypes. So um, tumors growing more in this nodular sort of ball-like phenotype versus this more infiltrative finger-like phenotype in the brain. Um, and so we categorized patients based on, on these two growth phenotypes. And what we found is that when we looked at the Karnofsky performance score, this is KPS, it's a clinical readout um, that's used to basically assess the neurological function of a patient. So 100 means you're at optimal level and the lower you get means you're having more neurological dysfunction. And what we saw is that these infiltrative tumors that were exerting less of this mechanical force, those patients tended to do better neurologically and have um, a better neurological performance than patients who had these more nodular um, tumors that were uh, presumably exerting higher levels of, of solid stress on the brain. You can see here the distribution of the neurological stores for, uh, scores for these patients is lower than for the infiltrative patients. And this was a really interesting finding for us. This was the first time that we were able to connect um, this, this mechanical uh, feature, solid stress, as essentially a biomarker in brain tumor patients. So we were able to show just based on um, tumor growth phenotypes that you would have worse neurological dysfunction if you're exerting higher levels of this mechanical stress on the brain. And it was also the first time um, that we were able to, to link this mechanical force to a clinical feature independent of fluid pressure. So I'm not showing the data here, but we showed in the paper um, through different types, different modalities of imaging, for example, T1 versus T2 weighted MRI, that this was completely independent of, of any changes in fluid pressure. This was due just to the, to the growth phenotype of those cancer cells. But of course, um, this leads to an obvious question, which was how do we actually know that these effects were due to the mechanical forces exerted by um, by these tumors and not simply by other biochemical effects of, of cancer cells. For example, um, releasing cytokines that could damage um, blood vessels or, or kill neurons. So we needed a model to be able to mechanistically or causally confirm that this was indeed a, a mechanical phenotype. So what we did is we actually um, adapted our cranial window that we use for intravital imaging with a set screw. And what we did is we would um, compress the brains of mice at a fashion that mimicked the rate at which tumors grew. So I know this looks a little bit um, medieval, but it was actually a very simple and effective system. This was designed by a mechanical engineer. So it's, it's, no, uh, it's no surprise that it's just sort of a, a screw in a window. But you can see here that um, an uncompressed brain looks normal. It has open, open ventricles. Whereas the compressed brain um, with this compression cranial window has um, significant compression of the, 
of the cortex or this um, this top part of the brain. And when we looked at um, the compaction of that tissue in proximity to, to the screw device, it recapitulated exactly what we see in terms of the compaction of tissue around a tumor as well. So at least in this very early study, we were able to confirm that just the mechanical force alone can indeed cause these nuclei to become sort of squeezed and elongated in their phenotype. So we wanted to see, could we use this model as a replacement for a tumor where all we have are the mechanical effects and we don't have to think about the biochemical effects of, of cancer cells. We can use this screw as sort of a stand-in for, for tumor growth instead. So what we started to do was um, look at the, the effects on neurons in, in these mice. So the first thing we found was that under compression, um, even though the tissue is, is compacted here, the, um, the number of neurons in the brain was significantly reduced. So these mice that were undergoing that chronic compression, which again was, um, was released at a rate similar to, to the rate at which tumors grow. So this occurred over, over a matter of weeks. This wasn't an acute compression. We found um, that they had a significant loss in the number of neurons, and this actually corresponded to a loss in neurological function as well. So we used a, um, a motor coordination study in the mice called the rotorod endurance test, where basically we um, map their ability to, we map the ability of a mouse to walk on sort of a, a turning wheel. And we could see that um, the mice that were undergoing this chronic compression, simulating the mechanical effects of a tumor, um, had significantly worse uh, motor coordination and control. And this was really an interesting model. We decided to actually use it as um, a drug screening device to see if we could test already approved FDA agents to see if they could overcome some of this loss of neurons or some of this loss of uh, loss of neurological function in the face of this chronic compression. So I'm going to skip over all the, the trials we did and just show you what worked. We actually discovered um, through this model that the drug lithium, which is a common antipsychotic agent, um, could actually protect neurons neurons in the face of this chronic compression. So these are two different groups of mice that are both receiving compression from that, that cranial window. And in mice that were treated with the vehicle, they had lower neurons in their cortex than mice that received lithium at the same time as compression. So lithium, we don't understand the, the exact mechanism of action here, but it's um, exerting some sort of neuroprotective effect on these neurons as well. Um, and again, I'm skipping over a lot of the, the details here, but in quantitative form, we found that um, we had a reduced amount of neuronal loss um, and overall brain tissue during lithium treatment and an improvement in motor coordination of the mice. So this implies that we might potentially be able to um, target neuronal health at the same time as anti-cancer treatments for, for patients in the future. But when we first did this study, um, as I showed you a couple of slides ago, when we made this observation that um, mechanical forces might be um, associated with worse neurological effects, we were relying on an indirect method of actually measuring that mechanical force. We were using tumor growth phenotype as the stand-in for this mechanical force solid stress. So of course we wanted to see um, if we could actually measure this force directly in, in brain tumor patients. So the way that we do this in mice, um, and again, I'm so glad I'm, I'm speaking to a physics audience here because normally I have to explain, go back to, to high school physics and explain using the spring analogy, what tension and compression means. I'm gonna skip over that, but you can imagine that within a tumor, because the tumor itself is heterogeneous, there are gonna be different areas that are under different levels of stress. And those stresses are gonna take different forms, including compression and tension. And if we want to understand and actually quantitatively measure the amount of stress that um, that is is encased within a tumor, we need to be able to, to measure it. And the best way to do that is actually to release um, that stored energy in order to um, watch the tissue relax. So the way that we do that in mice is we resect tumors um, from the, the host organ, whether it's the brain or the breast or the pancreas, we resect the tumor and we cut it in half. And when we cut the tumor, we actually release um, all of these stored solid stresses. And when we release that stress, the tissue starts to relax and deform. So areas that were originally under compression, so squeeze shut, start to bulge up, and areas that were originally under tension or being pulled down start to retract. 
And we can image this quantitatively using optical methods. This is an example of um, ultrasound, micro ultrasound imaging of, of a breast tumor that's been extracted from a mouse. So when we first cut the tumor, um, it was sitting here at this yellow plane. And over the course of a few minutes, the tissue starts to deform due to this release of these mechanical forces. So again, areas that were compressed bulge and areas that were under tension start to retract. And through this type of 3D imaging, we can actually produce um, 3D quantitative maps or 2D quantitative maps of how um, the tissue is deforming. And by the simple process of Hooke's law, if we combine um, this deformation with the material properties of the tissue, we can actually start to calculate physical levels of, of solid stress that are exerted um, by, the, by the tumor. So you can see here that various areas are under um, compression, whereas edge areas are often under, under tension. So we could do this in a human patient as well, for example, in a, in a resected tumor. Um, but as we know, it's not always easy to resect the entire tumor. And um, pathologists, of course, wanna get a hold of the tissue as quickly as possible. So they're a little bit unwilling to let us sort of slice into it and make all these mechanical measurements where they're you know, really anxious to, to get the tissue into RNA sequencing and, and other effects. So we wanted to see if there were other ways that we could try to measure um, these mechanical forces in the, in the patient themselves. So at MGH, uh, Mass General Hospital, where I did my, my training, um, the, patient, the neurosurgeons there use a neuro navigation system called Brain Lab during surgery. So they use um, what looks, it almost looks like a pen. Um, it's a probe that maps back to the preoperative MRI so that when they're sitting there in the operating room and they touch this probe to the skull, they can see exactly where they are in proximity to the tumor. And this allows them to, to perform surgery more accurately so that they're not cutting into areas where, where there is no tumor. And so when they do this, the, our clinicians told us that, of course, the first step in a brain tumor surgery or a brain tumor resection is we have to open up part of the skull in order to actually get to the, to the tumor in the brain. And it turns out that when we open up that part of the bony skull, often clinicians notice that the brain tends to bulge or herniate up towards or even through that hole that they created um, in, order to, in order to get down to the tissue. And so we propose that a very large component of um, this bulging phenomenon is due to those stored mechanical stresses. So for example, what we think is happening is exactly what we do in the, in the mouse model. When we release the stress, it starts to bulge. And we think that that's exactly what's happening here in the patients as well. So we can use the same navigation probe that, that the clinicians use to figure out where they are to actually measure the extent of that deformation, the amount that the brain bulged above this opening in the skull. And then again, use computational methods um, where we can map the amount of deformation. You can see this is an actual um, brain tumor in an actual human brain. You can see the extent to which it's bulging um, during this, this, uh, this brain tumor resection surgery. And from here, we can um, calculate the, the amount of solid stress in a patient on a per patient basis. So we're still sort of um, exploring these techniques and, and trying to figure out what we can make of it. But it's very exciting because if we can take these measurements at the time of surgery, later as the patient responds to um, therapy or undergoes other types of testing, hopefully we can establish solid stress as a mechanical biomarker um, in the same way that stiffness, for example, has been established as a biomarker. So I'm just going to quickly go through um, some of these simulation results here. Um, but it turns out, so each of these dots here is an individual patient for which we took a measurement of the amount of that bulge um, over the brain. And what you can see here is we can actually use um, basic mechanical modeling to estimate the extent to which they might have lost their native brain tissue due to the presence of the tumor. So again, going back to this idea that tumors grow in different ways, we think that tumors that grow in this more nodular form aren't really replacing that much of the brain. We think that they're just simply adding mass and damaging the brain as they expand. Whereas these more infiltrative tumors where it's very difficult to sort of distinguish where they where the demarcation is between tumor and brain, we think that these tumors are actively killing and replacing the brain as they grow. So we expect much less sort of volumetric increase in, in that case. And that's exactly what we saw through um, the modeling on a per patient basis. So tumors that exert lower levels of stress tend to have higher levels of brain tissue loss than tumors that exert higher levels of stress that grow more in that, in that ball shape. They tend to um, create less overall brain tissue loss in patients. <laughs> 
And in addition to this type of biomarker, we also think that solid stress might be a sensitive um, indicator of whether or not a treatment is working. So we actually performed um, a similar type of experiment in the mice where we remove a piece of the skull um, right above the, the tumor, just like we would in a patient, so that we can make these same estimates of the amount of, um, of uh, solid stress on a, on a mouse basis. So this is an example of breast cancer brain metastasis that we treated um, with a chemotherapy regimen. And early on during treatment, you can see here um, on this right-hand graph that the control tumors versus the chemotherapy-treated tumors don't actually have any difference in volume. It's still early enough that the tumor hasn't significantly responded to the treatment. But even though there's no volumetric change, we can actually already start to observe a drop in the amount of this um, mechanical force solid stress. So it could be that this is actually a more sensitive biomarker of response or even resistance to a therapy than, than even um, tumor volume. So this is something that, that we're hoping to, to sort of push further. Okay, so for the last part of my talk here, I, I want to um, speak a little bit about this most recent study that I put out, which was, um, of course, as I started training in brain tumors, immunotherapy was becoming um, standard of care in, in many cancers. And the problem is, is that brain tumor patients, including those that um, that have the, the cancer glioblastoma, tend to be very poorly responsive to these immunotherapies that have caused cures in, in other cancer types like melanoma. So less than 10%, less than 10% of glioblastoma patients actually respond um, to immunotherapies. And of course, coming from a tumor microenvironment training, my bias is to think that that is posing a lot of um, treatment resistance to, to this type of therapy. So I wanted to try to investigate if I could actually target this mechanical force, solid stress, in order to improve um, immunotherapy outcomes in, in, these, um, in these tumors. And so when we think about strategies to actually target this mechanical force, we have two options because there's only two contributors. We're only thinking about solid components of the tissue, which is the cells and the matrix that they produce. But as we discussed on, on the very first slide, it's difficult to think about targeting cancer cells. We're frankly not very good at killing off individual cancer cells, whether it's with chemotherapy or targeted therapy. And of course, the tumor includes a, a major component of cells um, that are not cancerous that have been sort of co-opted um, in order to, to benefit the cancer. So instead of focusing on the cell component, I decided to fo focus on the matrix component. And the idea here is that if we can target the extracellular matrix that's overproduced in, in cancers, including brain cancer, <clears throat> that we can hopefully decompress blood vessels that were originally squeezed shut by this mechanical force. If we can reduce some of that loading and reduce some of those mechanical forces, we can open those blood vessels back up. But this has to be a combinatorial approach. If we simply just open up blood vessels, the cancer is going to love it and it's going to continue to grow and to expand. So this approach has to be combined with some sort of cancer fighting agent like a chemotherapy, or in my case, I was very interested in immunotherapy. So this is a combinatorial approach where we think targeting matrix will decompress blood vessels so that we can better penetrate the tumor with, with whatever therapy we're interested. And in sort of proof of concept studies, um, I showed that if we depleted um, the matrix molecule hyaluronin, which is highly prevalent in brain cancer, you can see that the number of blood vessels that are perfused and have blood flow through them, um, this is an example of an untreated tumor where there's very few um, perfused blood vessels in green. But when I treat with this enzymatic approach to deplete the amount of hyaluronin matrix within, um, within the tumor, you can see that the number of perfused blood vessels increases rapidly. Now, unfortunately, this approach is not clinically translatable. Um, in fact, um, some groups tried to translate this enzymatic approach to the clinic for pancreatic cancer and ended up killing patients. So this is a little bit um, too aggressive. We need something that's going to modulate the matrix without significantly decreasing matrix, both at the tumor site and throughout the body. So I'm going to skip through all the pharmacology here and just um, show you what we, what we landed on. So there's a class of drugs um, commonly used to treat antihypertension um, known as angiotensin receptor blockers. And these block the binding of the ligand angiotensin II to their type 1 receptor, angiotensin type 1. And downstream of this pathway, which is obviously largely blood vessel related, is actually a lot of matrix synthesis pathways, including TGF-beta, connective tissue growth factor, hyaluronin synthases, 
And so we found that a commonly prescribed drug called Losartan, there might be some folks on the call on this drug. My, I have member, members of my family who are on this drug. It turns out that we can actually use this drug Losartan to target the matrix of tumors. So before I started on this project, other members of my training lab had shown that this um, approach works in cancers that are outside of the brain. So this is an example of pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma in a mouse. And again, this is intravital imaging through those transparent windows, but this time we have a window sitting above the pancreas of a mouse. Um, and in this case, we're imaging with multi-photon image combined with um, second harmonic generation imaging. And second harmonic generation allows us to observe fibrillar matrix protein. So in this case, collagen, which is highly prevalent in, in um, tumors outside of the brain. So you can see here before Lasartan treatment, this tumor is full of matrix. It's chock full of collagen, especially in the central regions of the tumor, where perfused blood vessels are basically restricted to the exterior, just the rim of this tumor. We have very little perfusion in the interior of the tumor. So if we inject the mouse with a chemotherapy, it's not going to get to the to the middle of this tumor. But when we treat with Losartan, you can see that um, the amount of collagen is significantly reduced to the point that blood vessels, which we couldn't observe before because they weren't perfused, are now decompressed because we've reduced matrix, we've reduced that, that mechanical force solid stress, they open back up. And what these researchers did is they actually combined Losartan with a chemotherapy and found that they could improve um, the survival outcome of, of mice using this approach. So I wanted to see if I could do something similar in the brain where we don't have a lot of collagenous matrix. It's mostly soft matrix like hyaluronin um, and also in the, in the context of, of immunotherapy. So the first thing that I did is I, I treated mice bearing um, glioblastoma tumors with this drug Losartan and looked at the effects on matrix. I focused again on this matrix molecule hyaluronin because it's the most prevalent matrix molecule in, in brain cancer and in the brain. And I found that Losartan was able to significantly reduce the amount of matrix in these tumors. And it also reduced the amount of solid stress, which we could image here with um, tissue deformation. So we basically had less of that, that bulging or valleying um, that we would expect to see if there were higher levels of solid stress. And then to see if this matrix reduction actually achieved that reperfusion or that decompression of blood vessels, I returned back to this intravital imaging technique um, of um, optical coherence tomography through the cranial window to observe blood vessel flow um, in the brain and in the tumor. So you can see here again, before therapy, we have this highly chaotic vasculature of um, the glioblastoma, which is outlined here in white. And we confirm this at the histological level. So um, the number of perfused blood vessels in green is very low, and we have a high prevalence of hypoxic cells due to this um, poor oxygen delivery in this area. But when we treat with Losartan, you can see that um, not only do the blood vessels become reperfused, so they're decompressed, they actually start to become more normalized in their phenotype. Um, I'm skipping over this part of the story for the sake of time today, but it turns out that um, this drug Losartan, in addition to decompressing blood vessels, actually helps, quote unquote, normalize them in the same way that an anti-angiogenic therapy would, for example, an anti-VEGF therapy. And you can see here that we confirm this um, at the histological level with um, a higher number of perfused blood vessels in green and a lower amount of hypoxia. But we wanted to understand what else is this drug doing um, overall in, in the tumor microenvironment of, of these brain tumors. So we started with bulk RNA sequencing of Losartan-treated tumors versus, um, versus controls to look at sort of general um, findings. And of course, we saw downregulation of pathways that we were expecting. For example, downregulation of matrix production, downregulation of blood vessel production, um, and of hypoxia. That was entirely expected. But we were surprised to see the effect to which some immune-related um, pathways were affected as well. And this sort of motivated us to dig a little bit deeper into what was happening in the immune cells within this tumor microenvironment in response to this drug Losartan before we even thought about combining with an immunotherapy. First, we had to figure out what is this drug doing on its own. So we used a few different methods here, um, again, in Losartan treated uh, glioblastoma tumors versus controls, including single cell sequencing, where first we looked just to see what types of, of T cells do we have. And we have everything that we would expect to find in the mouse as we would in the human, including um, naive conventional CD4 T cells, uh, T regulatory cells, and our good guys, our cytotoxic 
T lymphocytes in green. And what was interesting was that this Douglasartan actually reduced um, the expression of immune checkpoints in, in these T cells, which cancer tends to um, upregulate and exploit in order to evade um, the immune system. So these checkpoints are normally breaks on the immune system, but if we downregulate them, it means that now these good guys in green can actually go on to, to fight the cancer. And when we looked at gene set enrichment analysis from um, T cells that were um, single cell sequenced between these Losartan treated tumors and controls, we saw an upregulation in, in metabolic activity and immune response that we would expect to see with sort of an anti tumor or tumor fighting capability. And finally, we um, confirmed this at the, at the protein level with flow cytometry, where we showed basically the ratio of these good guys, these CD8 um, cytotoxic T cells to the bad guys, these T regulatory cells increased um, increased with this treatment, which is exactly what we want to see if we're trying to, to fight the, the um, cancer with the immune system. But T cells are not highly prevalent in brain cancer. So the most abundant immune cell um, sort of category in, in brain cancer is myeloid cells. So myeloid cells um, are a huge compartment of, of brain cancer. This is an example of uh, myeloid cell staining in, in a brain tumor in a mouse. And sometimes up to 30, 40, 50% of your tumor can be um, populated by these myeloid cells. And they tend to almost always be present in a tumor supporting um, or pro-tumor phenotype. So they're really there helping the cancer rather than fighting against it. And so we went back to sort of these molecular approaches in these Losartan treated tumors. And first at the bulk RNA sequencing level, we found that this drug could actually downregulate some of that tumor supporting um, gene activity. Um, and we wanted to confirm this at the, at the single cell level as well. So single cell RNA sequencing of these myeloid cells showed um, an upregulation in basically anti-tumor or tumor fighting phenotypes, including for antigen presentation or for activating T cells. Um, but we also saw a downregulation of um, genes that would either support the tumor or dampen um, T cell response. And again, we confirmed this at the protein level by flow cytometry. Um, I know these TISNI plots are a little bit weird to look at in, in terms of flow, but there are multiple types of myeloid cells in brain tumors, including myeloid-derived suppressor cells, microglia, which are the resident um, immune cell in the brain, and tumor-associated macrophages that come in from, from the circulating blood. And to summarize this sort of briefly, in untreated tumors, we see sort of a plethora of all of these different types of cells. They're prevalent in very large numbers, and they tend to skew mostly over to this pro-tumor, sometimes referred to as an M2-like phenotype. Um, but when we treat with Losartan, we see, first of all, the number of those cells is reduced. So we've sort of turned off part of that, um, of that immune system as well. And we've reprogrammed what's left over in large part over to this M1-like or anti-tumor tumor fighting phenotype. So this was really encouraging to see. So finally, we had all this evidence that we can reduce mechanical forces, we can reperfuse the blood vessels, we can potentially reprogram part of the immune system as well with this drug Losartan, which costs less than a dollar per day. So we were finally ready now to combine with an immunotherapy. We decided to combine with the drug anti-PD-1, an anti-PD-1 antibody specific to the mouse. Um, but we, we picked this immune checkpoint blocker because it's um, the most prevalent that's under clinical testing for, for glioblastoma patients. And they tend to be, <clears throat> again, highly resistant um, uh, to, to this checkpoint blockade. So when we treat with Losartan alone in this light blue curve, we don't see any benefit um, to survival, which is exactly expected. We don't think that, that this drug is going to do anything. It's basically just remodeling the, the tumor microenvironment so that therapies can work better. When we give the mice the immune therapy alone, there is an improvement in the median overall survival, um, but eventually every single mouse dies off. It wasn't until we combined these two drugs together that we finally saw a more drastic improvement in the median overall survival. And we also finally saw the emergence of some of these long-term survivors. So these are mice that have been cured of, of their tumors. And so uh, speaking to our immunology colleagues, of course, I just like I'm not a real mechanical engineer, I'm also not a real immunologist. So I relied heavily on, on our colleagues to guide me as to how do I prove that, that these um, surviving mice really did cure their tumors. And the way that you do that is you actually give them a second tumor. You give them a rechallenge of a second tumor inoculation in the other part of the brain and see if they can fight it off. 
And indeed, all of those mice that had cured their original tumors um, also um, did not um, succumb to a second tumor inoculation compared to naive controls that all died once they, once they received a tumor. So we thought this was really interesting, but like most people who are working in, in cancer therapy and especially cancer immunotherapy, every time we see a response like this where some mice died, you can see some mice died quite early in this dark blue curve. Some mice had a little bit of a, a median overall survival improvement, but eventually died. And then a few were completely cured of their tum tumors. So we're having this differential response in mice that are genetic clones that have the same microbiome, that have the same food, that get the same water, these are siblings, they came from the same mother. So in order to try to understand what is causing these differences in, in response, again, coming from my background, I was very biased to assume there must be some difference in their tumor microenvironment before they, before they get therapy. But we wanted to be able to assess this. Can we actually determine if there are factors in the tumor microenvironment that will dictate whether or not a mouse or an individual patient will respond to therapy? But in the mouse models, if I take out that tumor in order to analyze it to see what's in it by RNA sequencing or by flow cytometry, now I can't treat that mouse anymore. I need to be able to both find out what's in the tumor microenvironment and treat it all within one mouse. So the way that we decided to do this was actually by designing a bihemispheric mouse model that gets two tumors so that we can achieve both of these goals at once within a single individual. So we actually implanted two identical tumors um, in the mouse. You can see here um, through the cranial window, as well as through ultrasound imaging, this mouse has two uh, roughly equally sized volumetrically um, tumors. So what we do in this model is we resect one tumor once they become large enough um, to be viable for treatment. We resect one tumor to undergo this analysis of can we predict how this mouse is going to respond based on what was in its tumor before we started treating it? So then the mouse that um, retains a single tumor goes on to receive treatment so that we can see how it's going to respond. So in this case, every single mouse is getting this blue line treatment, this Losartan combined with immune checkpoint blockade anti-PD-1 therapy, because you can see every single mouse responded differently. So in this bihemispheric model, every single mouse is getting the same combination therapy and look at how they're each responding differently. Again, you have some that don't respond at all. They die at the same rate at which untreated mice would die. You have some that have an improvement in median survival. So we call these responders. And then you have some that cure their tumor and they, and they live forever. These are our long-term survivors. So now we know how each mouse responded individually, and we have an identical of its tumor that we collected before we started therapy. So now we can go back to that original tumor, see what was in it, and see if we can predict why it responded the way it responded. So we could have analyzed these tumors any way we wanted. Again, we could have done RNA sequencing. We could have analyzed them for solid stress, other mechanical um, features. But we decided um, to perform flow cytometry to look at protein expression on immune cells. And I'm skipping over the details here. Everything um, is published now. But basically, we were able to derive um, these sort of signatures of response based on what the immune profiling looked like. It's not unexpected. So for example, you can see here that these mice that died at the same rate as untreated mice had immune profiles in their tumor before they ever received therapy that were much more skewed towards immune cells that favor the tumor growth, that help the tumor grow. Whereas these mice that um, cured their tumors were enriched for immune cells that, that fight against the cancer before we even started immunotherapy. And so the benefit of doing this type of analysis is we were able to get down to the nitty gritty, for example, what type of immune cell, maybe a proliferating um, uh, cytokine producing NK cell is gonna perform in one of these boxes. And we can check down every single type of immune cell that we want to, to derive these sort of signatures of response. So I think this type of modeling, this bihemispheric model is gonna be um, helpful in the future to try to, try to predict um, whether or not a mouse is gonna respond. So just in the, the last minute here, this is the last bit of data. We had sort of a surprise finding in the study, which we weren't expecting to see at all, which was related to um, what are called immune-related adverse events, or IRAEs. This is a big area of focus in immunotherapy because it turns out that even in patients who respond, often they're left with these sort of debilitating, almost autoimmune-like reactions that sometimes are even worse than, than the cancer was before. And so it turns out that when we um, spoke to our clinical collaborators, 
some patients, not every patient, but some patients actually experience an increase in edema or fluid pressure in response to immune checkpoint blockade or ICB. So you can see here, this is an example of a patient where their tumor is here in the center, right where my, my red dot is. And all of this gray area around it is fluid pressure, fluid buildup, also known as edema. And you can see after treatment, the patient is actually responding, the, the tumor is shrinking, but the amount of fluid has increased significantly. And we were able to um, recapitulate this in the mouse and figure out sort of what was happening. So this is multi-photon imaging through cranial windows in mice where the cancer cells are in green and the blood vessels within the tumor are in red. And so this is a control mouse, but you can see that over time with treatment with immunotherapy, these blood vessels actually start to leak the tracer out. We injected mice with this red tracer so that we could visualize the, the blood vessels. But over time, they actually start to leak tracer out, indicating that we're having some sort of disruption of that, um, of that blood vessel wall so that the, the tracer is leaking out. So this immunotherapy is doing something to the blood vessels to cause them to become even more leaky. And again, for anybody who works in cancer, when you hear the term leaky blood vessels, the first thing you think about is VEGF or the VEGF pathway, because this has been very well described by my former lab and others. It turns out that that's not what's happening here. So um, again, our clinical collaborators, they found that when patients do experience this increase in um, fluid leakage, it can be up to 20% on average increase in the amount of fluid. And again, this is in the brain housed within the skull. So this can actually be lethal if it's, if it's at a high enough value. The way that this is typically um, counteracted in the clinic is actually to give very um, potent steroids, corticosteroids. But this is counterintuitive because they're immunosuppressive. So they actually turn off the ability of immune checkpoint blockade to, to do its job. And um, our clinical collaborators did try anti-angiogenic therapy, anti-VEGF therapy to see if that worked and it didn't. So this told us that there's something else going on that's independent of, of this VEGF pathway. So I'm gonna skip through, um, this is one of those typical, now I've become one of those professors who you know normally will um, show a whole thesis on one slide. Now I'm showing my own thesis on one slide where um, through single cell sequencing and some mechanistic models, we were able to figure out what's actually happening here. So it turns out that when we collect the endothelial cells that line the blood vessels of tumors and we single cell sequence them, we found that this immunotherapy increased a very specific type of matrix metalloproteinase, um, these membrane types, MMPs 1 and 2, which are the same as MMP 14 and 15. And so these have been implicated in some other cerebral diseases where you get this sort of leakage in, in the brain from the vasculature, but this hadn't been shown before in, in brain tumors or in response to therapy. So immunotherapy is upright regulating um, these um, uh, enzymes, which are basically eating up the, the blood vessels, creating these larger gaps and fluid is leaking out of them. What Losartan does is this is um, an experiment where we actually measure the amount of total water in the brain what Losartan does is it actually reduces the amount of fluid leakage, even in combination with anti-PD-1 um, therapy, this immune checkpoint blockade. So you can see that PD-1 increases the amount of water in the brain, whereas combining reduces it back down. And we confirm this mechanistically with a broad spectrum MMP inhibitor. So these have been tested clinically for brain and other cancers. They don't work in the clinic. They don't, they don't help because they tend to be off-target or non-targeted. But at least in this mechanistic study in the mouse, we could show that in Indeed, we think this is the mechanism that's happening is um, Lasartan is downregulating these um, MMPs and sort of keeping some of that integrity of the blood vessels so that they're not leaking fluid out. Um, I think I'm just about at time here, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. I do want to show one slide on some of the stuff we're doing that I think will appeal to this audience. So um, I hope I've been able to um, convey my enthusiasm for these tumor mechanical forces and um, and to show you how this mechanical force solid stress can damage the brain and can affect our ability to, to actually treat tumors, but that it might serve as an interesting target, um, including some of the, the work that we did with this novel biomarker. Um, I'll come back to my, my acknowledgements. I just wanna show um, one image here. So at my new lab here at Notre Dame, what I'm really interested in is now pushing forward this idea of what's happening in the tumor microenvironment, specifically in the context of these immune cells. I'm really interested to understand the sort of context or, or crosstalk between mechanical forces and immune cells. 
under this general hypothesis that these abnormal mechanical forces might actually be feeding immunosuppression, which of course will confer treatment resistance. So if we can identify some of these um, pathways, hopefully we can target them in order to improve immunotherapy outcomes beyond what I've shown with Losartan here. And the way that we achieve this is a combination of um, mouse modeling, intravital imaging, um, multi-omics, including RNA sequencing at the single cell level, and basically being able to either measure or apply mechanical forces at, at multiple levels, including at the cellular level, at the organ level, these are organotypic brain slices that we use um, in vivo in the mouse and even at the, at the patient level as well. So one of the projects that I think would be of interest to this group that maybe by next year or the year after we'll have a little bit more to, to actually talk about is we're trying to establish what we're calling a mechanome of these um, tumor immune microenvironments here, where if we can combine these maps of mechanical forces with some of the omic data that's available to us, whether it's epigenomic, genomic, transcriptomic, hopefully we can start to connect some of these mechanical findings to the transcriptomic or genomic or epigenomic findings as well, and reveal some of these, these novel treatments, not just for, for solid stress, but for some of these other mechanical features as well. So with that, I'll go ahead and, and wrap up. This is an old photo. This is from a uh, previous um, uh, Christmas, which is a very big deal here in Notre Dame. It is called Christmas. It's not called the winter holiday. Um, but we, I have a fantastic group here, and I, I think in another year or two, I'd be able to talk about some of the work that we're doing. Um, for, for the work that I showed today, everything was done during my training period. So I'd like to thank my, my former mentor, Rakesh Jain, over at MGH, um, all of our fantastic collaborators, um, including my colleague, Hadi Nia, who's at, at Boston University. So 